Hello everyone, hope you are doing well. Welcome to another episode of DevOps with Zach. I'm Arshad Zakaria and today I have Kanchana Vikramasinghe to discuss about how SRE relates to DevOps. He is a VP and Product Manager of Corio Data Plane at WSO2. So let's get started. Hi Kanchana, thank you very much for joining with me today. So how are you doing? I am good, Ashad, and um, yeah, uh, it's a bit sunny in Melbourne today, so hopefully it stays ah, Okay, so it's, it's raining in Singapore today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so real nice to, uh, uh, you're here. I mean, real nice to uh, uh, have you here as a, a guest today. So today uh, I thought of, you know, uh, discuss about uh, the SRE and DevOps. So uh, I want to make sure like uh, everyone know that uh, what's the main, main difference of SRE and DevOps uh, to, you know, uh, fulfill them with the knowledge. So, uh, sh- shall we talk about like uh, how SR is uh, different than DevOps? Sure, sure. So may- maybe I should start um, like because um, the DevOps came first, right? Until yes, correct. Google kind of um, started announcing that they're using the SRE, which they have been using for a very long time, even though it came out a little bit later. So if you look at DevOps, um, DevOps is actually not a single person. So. I think that's where a lot of the people get a little bit confused around what is DevOps and what is SRE and so Correct. on and so forth, right? DevOps is really like, if you look at it, it's a set of practice that helps the, the people behind it to automate and integrate process between the software development team and the IT teams, right? So that the, the development team can build test release much faster in a reliable way, right? That kind of in a nutshell is kind of like the encapsulation of what what is DevOps, right? Some people still refer to it as a culture. Obviously, now there are industry um, uh, you know titles around it, like DevOps engineer, uh, <laughs> DevOps architect, so on okay. and so forth. Correct, correct. But it all revolves around that, right? And again, there is a there is a statement by I think it was one of the Atlassian. Um, uh, you know, people who probably had the product for their um, service days, he said DevOps isn't a single person. It's everybody's job, right? That's that's true, yeah. yeah. Having said that, obviously, right, DevOps um, came about because of the dysfunction between the um, uh, engineering development teams and the operations. It used to be developers develop and throw it over the fence to the operations and operations had to go figure out with the, whatever the nodes they had, so on and so forth, how to deploy this and get this one running up and running in production, right? Yeah, correct. However, with you know a lot of this agility and so on and so forth, what happened was like they started, okay, well, you know, we wanted to work together very closely because you know things are in higher demands now. So why don't we actually you know work together in a way that the operations team can help the developers to go faster, like I said earlier, like, you know, you build, test, get the software out quicker, right? So Correct. then they started putting things like CI CD, you know, CI for continuous integration, continuous deployments, Git-based workflows, and also, you know, to, to manage what's in production, you know, IT services and incidents and so on and so forth. That's kind of like the birth of the, the DevOps, DevOps moment, right? The SRE, on the other hand, um, so on the Google side, so what they kind of define um, in terms of SRE, there was mastermind by uh, somebody uh, called Ben Kenya. He never really wrote the definition, but what he says is what happens when the software engineer or the developer put something into production and they had to look after it. They had to carry a pager. So it means that your application is up and running, you know, it's available all the time, right? One good example was, Ashad, that the SRE engineers that were looking after the Google's search page, you know, the page that you land. Everyone right? uses use that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Everyone uses it. So they have, they have so many engineers, like, taking turns and carrying the pager, Right. Even if they were having a shower, I, I, I was listening to one of their one of their talks. They had the, sh- the 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 pager in practically in the shower because if something has gone wrong on their website, nobody can do any searches, right? Okay. But what that led to was 
when things put it into production, the SREs or the site reliability engineers, I think the original came because they were kind of looking after site and then obviously it expanded into applications as well, but they kept the name as SRE, right? And, and what they were doing is, unlike the DevOps, they wouldn't like come in and help you with putting the tooling and so on and so forth together, right? To, 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 for you to test, uh, you know, do your um, continuous integration, continuous testing, all that. But what they did, the SRS did was to actually help running that application in a more efficient way in production, right? So find out things more Correct. proactively than reactively, right? If your application, for example, is slowing down, right? they needed to know in advance kind of like why is it kind of slowing down where is it kind of slowing down so, and then and, and take it back to google again one of the things that they did was like say if they were getting millions i hit search for let's say you know we have covid now right like when the yeah. covid outbreak came out first people were hitting they didn't really care about the page three page four of the search they wanted to get the information in the first couple of pages but if the other play pages slow down, it didn't really matter, right? So correct, with, yeah. the, with the search engine product engineers, the SRE team worked together saying, let's make sure that people get the answers they want, maybe in the first page or in the second page. But if the others slow down, it's okay, right? That I, again, I think, uh, yeah, Kanchana, we, we, uh, we can accept, right? Even though, like, uh, personally, when we search, uh, I don't think we go for, like, four or five pages, right? Like, we don't. We don't, we don't right? right? We don't, yeah, yeah correct. Exactly. Yeah. Normally, you know, you would go the second page, right? Yeah. yeah. Correct. 90% of the time, you ended up in the first page. 95%, maybe you might go to, right? It's highly unlikely to go to the third page, unless correct. you couldn't really find, right? Yeah. So that led to, what are we going to tell our customers the availability, which is commonly known in the industry for a very long time, the SLA, service level agreement, right? Yeah. Typically, way back, you know, when, when we didn't have the agility, we didn't have the cloud, normally, if you were lucky, you would get 99.95, right? Avail okay. Available, right? Yeah. Which means you're still down for quite a significant amount of time over a year. But that also, <coughs> excuse me, that also had, um, scheduled downtime. But when Google, Amazon, and Facebook, those guys came into picture, they did not really consider having scheduled downtime. They wanted to give a seamless experience. Yeah. If they said 99.95, that means the whatever the product or the, the site that they, you know, given will have 99.95. Very minimal downtime. Okay. They continuously do the, the zero downtime deployments. I, I, like that, uh, that's absolutely you don't feel right. It right. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, so then the SRE engineers, um, what they decided was, if you're telling the customer the site is going to be available 99.95, which means internally we need to have a service level objective, which is SLO, which, mu which is much higher than that, right? Because right. nothing can be really 100% available that is kind of a fallacy right it, it, it people people may still feel like it's 100 percent available but that negligible downtime they don't really you know get it right so they're, they're okay with it right so so that kind of led to google engineers defining the sr is defining this uh, service level objectives and they said service level objective must be one minus a very small error budget, right? What that means was you cannot have a system with zero errors, right? That, that's, we in, have to agree. We that's right. Have a, yeah, we have to agree. Yeah, way back, like, um, you had a program called, I think it was Star Wars, or I think they may have it even called it Star Wars. What they were trying to do was to get to zero defects. We spent a lot of money couldn't achieve it, right? What they didn't really think about is, you know, you cannot have zero defects software, right? Definitely. So, that's why we have releases monthly, like, uh, uh, that's the purpose of that, right? Like, um, we exactly. cannot have, like, zero, uh, zero error application. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. So they agreed with the team. So now the difference there is now, if you think about your original topic, DevOps versus the SREs, right? They have to work very collaboratively because the DevOps engineers, right, help the developers to get things into production in a very efficient way. SREs, on the other hand, work with them to ensure that what when it get to production, right, it perform the way that you said the SLOs and SLAs, right? And if your error budget is going high, for example, you may not be able to meet the SLA that you've given to the customer, right? So then the SRE engineers, unlike the DevOps engineers, they get down and sit down with the developer, sometimes even by themselves, kind of look at the application and how it works. Now, this is a major difference to what the DevOps engineers do. DevOps engineers do a lot of still operations work compared to SRE. In Google's philosophy was you only spend 50% on operation activities. You spend on the other 50% improving the application, right? How it runs in production, how it handles the errors, how it actually improve and, you know, get the feedback to the developers so they can actually immediately, you know, fix the bug. So, so Kanchana, where the, that's the point where the observability comes, right? That's right. That's right. So 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 in terms of both DevOps and uh, SREs, right, you have the traditional kind of observability as well, but companies like, which is now part of Google, Dora and so on and so forth, have come up with research-based metrics that helps the team to identify that measure what matters, right? Correct. It's, correct, it's correct. not about measuring everything. You're measuring what matters, right? If you got 10 microservices, you know, you need you need to be able to measure the latencies between all those microservices and also have an aggregated level metric saying my business service combine all those microservices, able to perform under uh, one second, 99% of the time, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and or even sometimes you might say 90, 95% of the time do it one second, and 99% of the time you would do it under two seconds, right? Now, that's Correct. a responsibility and observability matrix that SL, uh, this SR engineers need. So they, they do this at multiple levels. Right, so they do it at the microservices, individual microservices level, as well as the full end-to-end tracing. Right, so that actually introduced things like distributed tracing, uh, ability to log at log at each point for for application logs as well as auditing purposes as well. Right, right. another thing that the SR engineers would be responsible as well in terms of are there any security leaks and things like that are going on. Right. Even even comes to logs, I have seen like uh, personally uh, uh, in some uh, corrections when they post in the blogs, you know, like they, they, they share all the logs, but they don't, they, uh, a lot of sensitive information is also there. They don't care. They just wanted to get the answers, but uh, they, ha- they have no idea about uh, what they're sharing on the uh, like uh, blogs or any medias to get the help. But I have seen a lot of uh, sensitive information on those logs. Like uh, I believe that I think we can add something like uh, uh, into that area, like uh, the, the the importance of the the locks, but at the same time, like you said, the security side. Exactly. So you don't need to imp, uh, like uh, lock ship all the info. Like uh, maybe we, we need only warning and errors, right? So yeah, like personally identifiable info. data, right? Like correct, if the, if that particular API had your name and your email address, things like that, those things need to be masked, right? They shouldn't be in the logs. Even the SRE engineer shouldn't be seeing that, right? Because correct. It's it's maybe okay still internally, but what if that get out? Like like you said, somebody posted on Slack um, overflow and you know asking for help, and yeah. you're basically exposing all the customer data, and and hence even why, IP like, addresses. <laughs> that's right, even IP addresses, right? I mean, yes, it might be internal IP addresses, but if they know the external IP address, they know what the internal IP address too, right? So so coming back to like the the you know the Dora. Uh, Dora team that is now part of Google, right? Correct. Um, they develop from a from a success criteria measurement, especially for the DevOps. They didn't do a lot of uh, metrics for the SREs as such because SREs was 
you know, driven by the SLI and the SLOs and finally by the SLA, right? And the, the stuff that they measure is equivalently important for both parties. Lead time, right? How long does an, a, a development team together with the DevOps team to get a product into production or a fix into production, right? And the frequency do the, develop, uh, the uh, deployment. Time to restore. Time to restore comes to the SRE, even though it's kind of like a DevOps activity, right? Because that's taken away from their error budget, right? Change fail percentage. Sometimes we say we want to deploy 10 times a day, right? But 10 times a day for certain API may not be correct because if it's a payment API, do the consumer or the you know the, the application developer, do they want to get interrupted 10 times, right? Probably not, right? And, and then the other thing they did was they compared how you perform with your industry peers, right? So you can, you can actually go to Google and if you, if you search on Dora, uh, the measuring framework, it lets you to kind of assess how your organization is doing as well, right? At the same time, there was another framework called CLAMS, which is, which is all about DevOps, the culture, right, what it stands for is culture automation, lean, measurement, lean. and sharing, right? That stands for CLAMS, right? So I think in a nutshell, Ashad, the, 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 the major key difference is between the DevOps and the SRE. SRE is, is not just about the observability, right? Observability is a big part of their day-to-day activities, but the, the 50% or more is to help the developers and the DevOps to improve what you're running in production. Right. Yeah, I can say like observability is a different area, like a, it's a vast area. So uh, it, 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 we can talk about like hours and hours about observability. I, I, personally, I love that part, uh, that area. Even absolutely, like the, the Ashad, matrix, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but it I've is seen needed. Lot of, sorry? No, no, I'm saying it, it is needed. Yeah. It is needed because the the what matters for SR is to measure. The only way they could do that is having the observability in place, right? So if there right. is no observability in place, you know, they won't be able to proactively know, right? Long time ago, a lot of people were reacting to it because the SLAs were much lower, so on and so forth. The world has rapidly changed. Things have gone agile. Evolving, and, right. evolving. Know, the technology is evolving, so we have to uh, exactly. polish the knowledge always, yeah. Exactly. Like if you think yeah. about, right, your even your mobile banking application, you know, sometimes occasionally I get messages say two o'clock in the morning that I, they're going to have a scheduled downtime. It's not that two o'clock in the morning that I would jump on the phone and actually want to check my bank balance or do a transfer, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. As a customer, I get a little upset. Oh, why, why are they doing that? Because what, what if, you know, I was in Sri Lanka or in Singapore, then the two o'clock in Australia is, is, a, is a working hour in Singapore or, or in Sri Lanka. I mean, Singapore might be slightly into the, into the nighttime, but Sri Lanka or UK, you know, it is still a working hour, right? Correct. And you could be doing an actual transaction. Right? Yes. It may so impact they, a lot of uh, business as well. Yeah. That's right. This is where the SREs come in to actually take those feedback from the customers and go back to the development and the DevOps teams and say, we need to think about how do we, how are we going to do our deployment zero downtime pretty much, right? Customers aren't going to impact, right? Even if they impact, maybe they can get to the login page. Maybe they might get an error for a second when they log in, but the next second they're able to log in, right? That would be an ideal situation. Customer might immediately get a little bit upset, but within a second they say, oh, okay, I can log in. Maybe it was an internet connection or something, right? But if yeah. it was down for an hour or two hours, they'll be very <laughs> unhappy, right? Very it will unhappy. be a very impact for the, uh, I mean, like... Uh, Personally, like so, like uh, end users and for the businesses, right? Those who are using their payment gateways and stuff. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and one more thing I love to add, like uh, share your opinion about this as well. So when we talk about the Dora, like uh, uh, we were talking about the time to restore service, right? So I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of uh, deployments they do in the day, night time. But as a person, I believe if we are practicing good DevOps uh, practices, uh, we don't need any downtime. We should be able to uh, release the uh, do the releases anytime as possible. For that, I think uh, 
uh, the, the 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 reproducible of the builds and the, the deployment artifact should be smaller size like uh, it should be able to reproduce very faster and uh, uh, i have seen that a uh, lot of uh, the, the articles are that a lot of problems with these build sizes like okay for example if you get a node.js application they they put all the third party plugins and you know they build like uh, the mbs and gbs of that their content image and Correct. trying to uh, if there anything like uh, to restore restore back to the previous version it's hard to do because of the huge size right so That's i think right. uh, that part was a really really important uh, in that area i believe yeah that's where the the sres and devops works very nicely close together correct um, i can't unfortunately name one of the the companies that i consulted here, here in australia very large telco they they one of the things when we moved them to devops sre culture one of the things we created was you deploy during the working hours the reason for that is you're fresh in the working hours you're not uh, you know coming at 2 o'clock in the night or uh, in the weekend where you you know you are very tired right and 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 doing so ashad like you said what we told them was keep your packages very small right because even if you're doing like a ro- rolling upgrade you want to keep it very small so that you can do that iteratively very fast very quickly right but certainly you can use the environments like kubernetes and so on and so forth now available to you so that means you can actually avoid a lot of the downtime that you traditionally had right taking approaches like blue, blue green deployments canary deployments ab testing so on and so forth was a- able to do with um you know the technologies such as kubernetes right so so I, I more think you see kubernetes uh, helps us to you know make our life easier uh, especially with the auto healing and auto scaling part uh, it's well, I, i would like to mention that one as well yeah personally i i, I love to use kubernetes so like like you said so you know the devops need to have those tools and fully automated if you're going to do deployments that frequently and during the day and even during the evenings of the week week weekday rather than in the weekends and and packaging it to be smaller those are the things that the sre team would come and help and say you know something that you're deploying is going to take a lot of time so even 2 2 minutes could be a big downtime in in today's environment yeah any uh, other questions i think it's a good, uh, good uh, anything else you want me to yes, add yes it's, it's a it's a good uh, ex- i mean like the uh, uh, very best uh, explanation i have seen so far about uh, uh, comparing these two really really thank you so uh I, I, when we talk, talk about sr and devops yes i think uh, this this area i think really really important to mention that you know the ex- accident can be happen right normally people may can do hum- human errors can be done so uh, oh, you, uh, personally I, as a best devops practices and uh, in a good devops culture uh, we should not blame that person so no no yeah, yeah. what do you think about that so so um you know my my uh, previous company uh, you know platformer from day one we had the the culture that it's uh, completely blameless right when you have post mortems they are uh, you know blameless post mortems the reason why we do the post mortems and do the five eyes and so on and so forth so we can identify what happened within a, within the company within the teams and also sometimes to explain to the customers as well and guess what when you actually been that honest to the customers and you're not blaming anyone you know pointing finger at anyone working collaboratively as a team uh, as a single team customers like it right and they also then tr- start to trust you more and more right doesn't mean that you know they would expect you to repeat the same mistake obviously not right but um you know they expect you to be honest and upfront and you know tell what happened and the only way that you could do that is you do not have a blame uh, you know blame culture right yeah, yeah that, that's Very correct important. right i mean like uh, uh, th- that's really important to understand that i don't like to call the devops engineers or sr engineers because like you said it's not one man person work so uh, uh, exactly. we can call it a devops enabler or devops uh, consultant or you know uh, i mean the, the reality ena- is in the in the, yes. in the industry they have you know uh, kind of like put titles for people that's okay i mean even we did that you yes. know and google has done that too and 
that's everyone is doing that. That's, that's totally agree. Yeah, that's I agree. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I, next one, I wanted to like talk about the postmodern, right? You already mentioned. So um, can you give us some, some tips like how to do a good postmodern and how to identify a bad postmodern, like a brief? I, I think the, like I said, if you had the culture that you're not going to get blamed or you're not going to, um, uh, you are not going to point finger at someone, which is also called um, psychological safety. Right, which is That's correct. Quite, quite quite important. So what happened then is the team become really open, right? Because they know the we, the reason why we have having the post mortem, we do not want to repeat this mistake again as a company as a team, right? When they get that, it's easier to go through the five eyes, as you know, you, you you probably have heard about the five eyes, to you know get to the root cause. Correct. You ask why this happened. And then, and then next, ask why? How could could we have avoided that? And you go up to a five, and most of the time, you actually before you get to the five, you actually know what has happened, right? Correct. In 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 rare occasions, you go through the five, and you may still not have an answer. That has happened. And once again, not having that blameless culture help. If you start actually saying, you know, come banging on the tables and say, what what the hell happened, and so on and so forth. Team gets really scared, and they don't want to collaborate. They will take as long as time to defend themselves. So they're going to come up with answers, not what you want. The, the so fake try, answers, like they, they want to pretend, okay, they want to cover, yeah. cover up their self, right? That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They come up and say, we didn't have login there, right? And that was not part of our framework. Architects did not actually ask us to do that. Right, because they are also trying to defend themselves and put put the blame in someone else. Right. Instead, if you had the blameless culture, you would say, when we work together with the architect, we completely forgot that we should have done login there. Right at that point, that you immediately know if we had done that, yes, we would have been able to get to the root cause very quickly. That that is what you want to achieve, not exactly. the other way around. Yeah. So where come the, the, the that's where come the process, right? Personally, I have done mistakes in my career, so uh, I'm lucky. Everyone to have, like, might. Everyone, I shall Everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I'm lucky to have like a good uh, ma- managers and leaders with me, so I have done mistakes. So, uh, like you said, they never blame, and we have this good culture uh, taking as a team. Uh, so if anyone is listening to this, I'm telling that be honest. So, uh, we, so when I when I have done these mistakes, so I, I I so first immediate action what I did is I inform my immediate manager. Uh, the lead right. that time, uh, I I told him the, exactly what happened. What is the what 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 the thing I did? Then he was calming me down and uh, immediately arranged a meeting and we were discussing what we can do. So so rectify that uh, immediately. So I think that 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 open up culture, like you said, uh, it's really important. It's not about uh, every day we're working tool with the tools, right? That like That's you said, right. that psychological uh, uh, things also safety, matter, yeah. right? Yeah, psychological safety is matter a lot. But it's hard, you know, I mean, because... It's about still, the mindset to understand also, I think. Not correct, everyone correct. can understand this. That's right, Ashan. I mean, if you think about everyone in an organization, if you're a junior intern, you've done a mistake, you know, you're a bit... We are humans, right? We're all humans. Even yes, though correct. we say we have a blameless culture, we have a psychological safety establishing, they may be afraid to talk immediately, right? Sometimes I have done that myself, like, you know, leave the room and... Let those people talk to the people who are who they may be comfortable with, right? Sure. Sure. Immediately, because we want to. At the end of the day, right? Even if you are the boss of the company, you don't want to be, you know, be a blocker to get the right answer, right? If you have to leave the room because they can speak freely and tell their immediate um, and get the right answer, you should do that. You should not have the the mindset of Oh, I am the boss. I should know everything. The only way you're going to get to know everything is if you actually establish a culture. I, like I that. personally believe that content. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't mind with the other person is a junior or senior uh, from a different caste or whatever. I do. I'm like, uh, there, there are a lot of things, right? Some people, like you said, okay, I'm the boss. I know everything. I'm this expert. I have this certification. No, I go and ask anyone, anyone. Exactly. I don't have like, if I want to know, I will learn. I would love to. Uh, learn so I, I would say like if anyone is listening be a good listener right so uh, 100%, 100% yes yeah and don't attack them right yeah you can you can always help them 
you can always, um, you know, go back and tell them like, okay, maybe you should think like this next time, right? That's the kind of culture and that's the kind of post-mortem that, you know, everyone wants to, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is there anything else you want to uh, tell my uh, our audience that uh, to follow um, or anything like that last? <laughs> I, I know, like I said, like, you know, industry has already, uh, you know, labeling engineers as DevOps and SREs and so on and so forth. But if you look at a typical DevOps engineer, what they should have is really good, ex- excellent communication skills, right? They should be able to understand system administration really well. Experience in tooling that are available, even if they are puppet, chef, or some of the legacy tooling, doesn't matter. I mean, that's how DevOps got started way back. And also start thinking like a developer. So you would start automating things, infrastructure as code, right? configuration management, all those things, you would kind of think, okay, I am also going to keep my stuff in Git. So why? What happens? It could be an environment issue. So I could revert my code back to how it was before. I don't want to blame the development team because it could be my fault, right? So things like that. So those kind of like the typical uh, DevOps engineers um, skills. Uh, SR is not a lot of different. The only thing that I could think about is in, in, in terms of the SREs, they're very heavy in um, how, how, how uh, observability and things like that are done. They may actually be uh, developers in their past life before they became an SRE. The reasoning is that sometimes they debug applications, right, to identify where the real issues are, right? So those are kind of the, like the takeaways in terms of like if you want to get into either the DevOps engineer stream or the SRE engineer stream. Those are kind of things that you probably need to start thinking about. Like you said, Ashad, I don't think that you should think SRE is only doing one thing, which is observability. That correct, is correct, completely correct. incorrect. Right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, Kanchana, for your time. And I, 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 uh, My like, pleasure, uh, Mike. Yes. So I'm planning to do another few sessions with you soon because it's really nice to talk into you today. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time and have a nice day. Okay, have a nice weekend. Yes, you too. Take care, stay safe as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kanchana, for joining with us today. Hope to see you all there soon with another episode of DevOps with Zach. Until then, take care. Bye bye.